Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today um, at the Committee for Sydney's panel on to discuss the curbside. We have a great um, panellists to joining us today. Um, my name is Nicole Badstuber and I'm the Committee for Sydney's Mobility Programme Director and responsible for transport research and transport policy. Today we'll be discussing um, the curbside and Uber and WSV have been working on a report called Future Ready Curbside, which they'll be presenting to us today. And that will be followed by a conversation with um, Lindy and Alex about um, how we manage and allocate space on the curb um, here in Sydney. So let me introduce the panelists to you today. We have Ashley Cormack, um, who is Uber City Policy and Research Heads Up Uber City um, Policy and Research Programme in Australia and New Zealand. And in this role, Ash is exploring how Uber and transport technologies can play a role in improving the productivity, livability and sustainability of our cities. Ashley's background is in transport, infrastructure, arts and culture, and it spans both the public and private sector. Graham Pointer is um, a geographer and planner and preoccupied with people and place. He joined engineering consultants WSP in 2018, following 15 years in public policy and analytical roles, both here in Australia and in the UK. Graham is WSP's future ready lead for Australia, supporting colleagues and clients to unpack future trends, as well as a key account manager role. He is on secondment part-time to the Business Council of Australia, advising on infrastructure and planning policy. We have Alex Omara, who is the Group Deputy Secretary of Place, Design and Public Spaces Group within the Department for Planning, Industry and Environment. Alex leads on two of the New, York's, New South Wales Premier's priorities, greening our city and greening public spaces. Um, Alex is also tasked with leading the work to reorientate the planning system around people, places and communities with a continued focus on greater upfront strategic planning, excellence in design, local neighbourhood character and public places. And we have Lindy Dates, which, um, who brings 26 years of local government experience to today's panel. Lindy is the general manager of Campbelltown City, where she leads the transitional phase of one of the largest and oldest councils in the state into a transformational powerhouse delivering innovative change for its communities. Lindy is working with all levels of government, private industry and community organisations to ensure that Campbell Town City gains the support it needs to embark on its evolution into a much bustling metropolis. Um, at this point, I'd love to hand over to Ash, who will be giving us a, a sort of an overview of the report and um, show a great video summarising that. Thank you, Nicole. I'll just... Um share my screen and we're just going to start with a video. Um, enjoy! If I can get it to work. The key to creating great cities is creating great places. However, at the moment, space on our streets is scarce. Our travel and consumption patterns are changing. There is growing demand for access to the curb to pick up and drop off passengers, takeaways and parcel deliveries. With 10 years of technology being compressed into one year, we have certainly noticed that the regulations and roadblocks in place on a state and local council level have certainly created a lack of flexibility into activating takeaway, delivery and alfresco dining. As a driver, my number one priority is to make sure my passengers get in and out of the car safely. One of the challenges I face is that when I'm dropping passengers off or picking them up on busy streets, there's nowhere to stop. As an Uber driver, I also have two daughters that I drop off and pick up at school. They have dedicated kiss and drive areas. It'd be handy if Uber had those as well. The lack of pick up and drop off for rideshare vehicles is actually the symptom of a broader problem in how we allocate curbside in our cities. The problem is, is that we've designed our cities for private cars, not people and how they want to use places. Decisions around how we allocate the curbside, whether it be a bus stop, a parked car or a bike lane, has a huge impact on the public realm. WSP was commissioned by Uber to unpack how to create future ready curbsides that serve great places. Our first recommendation and crucial recommendation 
is that we need to co-design our vision for places with the local community, businesses, and with government. Next is getting those planning and policy documents right. Too often they focus on movement function over place. Our third recommendation is that we need to really focus on getting our curbsides working harder for our local businesses and for communities. By shifting the focus from private car travel to shared mobility, including walking, cycling and public transport, cities can keep moving and create great places. We need to work together, government and industry, to ensure that curbside delivery and alfresco dining increase to meet customer demand. We think future transport technology presents a huge opportunity to improve the livability of our cities and lead us to a zero emissions future. But we've got to get the basics right, and the curb is a great place to start. Well, hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm Ashley Cormack, as Nicole said, I um, am at Uber, I'm in the public policy team and lead our cities program. Um, thank you, Nicole, for your earlier introduction and of course for your starring role in our video. We're very excited to be able to launch this report today with the Committee for Sydney. And so, um, Graham and I just thought we would give a bit of a brief overview of the report now um, before we get into our panel discussion, which we're really keen to get to. It's to give you a little bit of um, context about sort of like, you know, why Uber's doing this. Um, part of my role here is to think about the broader urban public policy challenges that our cities are facing in Australia and New Zealand, and then think about how Uber through our products, technology, and through commissioning research like this can support cities in achieving those objectives. Um, so one of the things I did want to sort of just show you before we dive into this particular piece of work is that the, I'm not sure if you've seen this before, these are the shared mobility principles for livable cities and Uber is a signatory to these along with a number of other companies, NGOs and governments. And I wanted to show you this for two reasons. Firstly, um, me and my other policy, cities policy counterparts around the world use these principles to shape a lot of our thinking and and our program. And the second reason is because, you know, when we briefed WSP on this work, we said we really wanted these principles to be at the heart of it and to think about how these relate to the curbside. And, and so Graham will probably reference them a little bit throughout his presentation. So I just wanted to share them with you now. So getting into this piece of research, I mean, really how this came about was, you know, Graham and I were chatting about how, you know, in theory, I think we all accept that place is really important and, and getting those livability outcomes. And we're good at um, thinking about that in a strategic sense, but how does it translate into the fine grain and into that local scale? And I think the curb is a really good example of an area where it, currently it doesn't do it particular well, particularly well. The curb is a crucial piece of infrastructure in our cities, yet it is quite a passive asset and I think it's often overlooked. You know, every day without even thinking about it, um, whether we're walking, riding or cycling, you know, we, we inter um, interact with the curbside. There are a number of current challenges um, with the curbside. You know, it's a contested space. Um, it has a lot of different uses. It's, it's a movement corridor and transport interchange, but it's also a public space. and we have a legacy of cities that have been designed for the private car and, and the curb really ref reflects that. In the future, we think things are going to get even harder. We have, you know, the shared electric and autonomous transport revolutions. What do they mean for the curb and is the curb ready for that? Uh, there is an increasing urban freight task, which has been accelerated by COVID. But I think probably most importantly is that, you know, we are living in growing cities and densifying cities. And so increasingly the curbside is part of the public realm and it's important that um, we, it, it's serving those place functions because there is an increasing demand and need for those livable spaces. So the way we um, sort of structured the report, there are four main parts to it. We start off with a policy overview, you know, what is the curb, get that definition right, why it matters and what are the challenges cities are facing. We then really wanted to kind of, I guess, translate that theory into, um, you know, what is the reality. And so we looked at two case studies, one in Sydney and one in Auckland, which Graham is going to go into in a bit more detail and look at how is the curb performing today in those areas. 
The third part is um, we wanted to look to the future and um, look at, take those two case studies and think about, well, what does the future hold for those areas? And what are the different tools we can use um, as city leaders to, to, um, to analyze that and to plan for the future? And finally, we sort of finish on 10 policy recommendations, which we'll, we'll get to shortly. Um, and part of these recommendations, the brief we really gave WSP was, you know, what do we need to do today to prepare for tomorrow? I think particularly on future transport, we can often get lost in the in the future of um, you know drones and um, AVs and things like that. But there are things we can do now to prepare for it, um, and so we should focus on that. I should also at this point acknowledge, you know, Graham and I, as we were. Um, writing this work, um, reached out to a number of our favourite industry colleagues and friends for feedback on these recommendations and, and we got some really helpful insights from different people, many of whom are in this webinar, so I wanted to acknowledge them and thank them for, for their work. I might now hand over to Graham, who's going to take us through the case studies. Over to you, Graham. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to kick off, just to mention, yeah, WSP, we really enjoyed working with this with Uber on this project. Um, it's been a great opportunity to really focus in on on place outcomes and what they mean for, for people uh, and really focusing on a piece of infrastructure that that doesn't get a lot of airplay but is really important for making our places thrive. Um, and so through the report we explore two case studies uh, as Ashley mentioned and, and we selected these based on what, what are those typologies we think will really resonate with city leaders, both, both public and private, the decision makers and, and communities and be relevant across Australian cities and, and New Zealand cities as well. So our first case study location is Crown Street in Sydney and established High Street. So we think that in a number of cities around Australia and New Zealand, there are these dense established locations that are relied upon around communities and, and a local catchment and treated as a destination. Um, when we looked at these case studies, we applied the movement in place framework to understand and, and, and consider their, their role within, within the network and, and that movement in place functions. So Crown Street, destination for locals, strong cafe dining, culture, mature tree canopy, and footpaths, assessed as a, a civic space. And we'll go into more on that in a little bit. And then our second location, which I think I'm particularly excited about and really enjoyed exploring, is an area in transition. Onahunga Mall in, in Auckland is lined with light industrial uses. There's some food and dining. It sits at the end of a rail line, serves an interchange function with, with bus. Um, and the roadway currently provides a really heavy movement function from, for people accessing the, the highway. And while I was excited about Onahunga Mall, and it took us a long time to agree on this location, finding the right one, was really because it's an area earmarked for, for rapid growth. So, so rapid growth in residential um, aligned to, to an interchange function and a strengthening of that place function as well. And so we felt that this location was particularly timely in the context of Australian cities like, like Sydney and, and Melbourne, where we're seeing rapid infrastructure investment with strong um, appreciation or expectation for residential growth. And then an expectation about improving and increasing livability alongside that. So what might the future hold for those sorts of locations? And so then just taking you a little bit through the types of analysis that we've done that you can explore at your leisure in, in the report was a part of our movement in place assessment, considering the curbside management and allocation by different times of the day. So on Crown Street, in an example, we can see that curbside use is, is stacked towards parked cars and loading zones during the day. And then in Onahunga Mall, we can see that no stopping zones are dominating reinforcing the streets movement function. Um, but, but should mention in that context that the role of the, the bus stops really supporting that interchange function with, with rail. Um, and also there's off street parking as part of park and ride for the railway station as well. But you can see that it fulfills a inherent within the no stopping is that it, it 
fulfills a strong movement function. Um, and it's also important to note that that's a 24 hour piece as well. There isn't a change in terms of time of day of how that curbside is, is managed or allocated. But I think our key finding from that piece of work and undergoing the site inspections was that, that cur the curbsides in both locations could be working a lot harder to serve those places and, and the people that access the place. We then framed it around seeing the future more clearly and, and used a couple of methods to do that that Ashley mentioned. So our system dynamics tool was updated with assumptions aligned to the shared mobility principles for livable cities. And that gives us an indication of what the future vehicle fleet will be composed of, focused on electric shared and automated. We also take a look at the movement in place framework and propose in our white paper, a new tint to it in terms of a new mobility update. So if our street types are held constant into, into the future, what does new mobility mean for all those streets? What are the objectives of the curbside by the different types of modes that, that will be coming, coming forward? Um, and what, what does that look like in terms of people's expectations for, for those streets? So I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. And so once we pulled those two pieces of analysis together, we pulled, we, we pulled together 10 key design principles that we think are important for facilities to consider as they look at future of curbside and what new mobility might look like. So following through that example from the update to the movement and place framework, if we consider electric vehicles in that context, we'd argue that charging infrastructure wouldn't be appropriate for, for civic spaces because that encourages um, car storage. Whereas we think that those dynamic locations, the hubs of community life, um, the, the curb should be treated a lot more productively, enable pick up and drop off, and, and potentially the reallocation of road space towards other functions, either enabling multimodal um, access or reallocation to, to uses that promote dwelling. Um, so seats, shade, uh, alfresco dining and the like. Um, and then pulling it together for our case studies, we kind of work through a number of aspects to apply those design principles to the, to the case studies, drawing on, on a lot of different pieces and then echo those in visualizations as a tool for engagement. It's actually mentioned going out to, to colleagues to, to consider what, what the future might hold for these locations. Um, so we can see a big shift in, in Onahunga Mall where we move a lot of that movement function to a parallel road and encourage that multimodal access to the interchange hub and the supporting land uses becoming a lot more focused towards restaurants and, and cafes. And then a key feature of Crown Street being that dynamic management of the curb that we can see the drop off zone there in the foreground. There's a lot to unpack in there. And perhaps if there's things, particular points of interest, we can catch, catch up with those in a little bit. But I think after undertaking this analysis, it was really clear to us during the project that we're not currently meeting the challenge of the curbside and what we need, and that we need to take action now to realize the potential of our places into the future and to, to fully grasp the opportunities of new forms of mobility so that they enable our vision of places and enable what we want from our places rather than detracting from it. And to that end, it is a white paper. So we, we give you 10, 10 actions or recommendations for city leaders, whether they be public or private, take forward. Um, in terms of one that I'd highlight right now, I'd go for co-designing the vision for places in partnership with the community, business and governments as being really crucial to achieving what we want from our places and, and how the, the curbside's role within that. So that's a really active engagement and then through that, we can flow through to people in place first approaches. There's a lot there to unpack, and I think we'll do that in our Q&A session. Ashley, I didn't know whether there was a recommendation you wanted to highlight as we push into the 
the Q&A section? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like trying to pick your favourite child. Um, but I think um, a, a couple of the recommendations that are sort of really front of mind for me is um, number six, like that dynamic management and allocation of the curbside. You know, we really need to get our curbsides working harder. And I think COVID was a really interesting case study of, you know, we were in this situation where we needed curbside to really support the increasing, um, you know, urban freight task with increased parcel and food delivery and it, it just was static it you know we weren't able to adapt it quickly enough to meet that need and that's I think that's something we should be able to do going forward I think the other call out I'd make is um I am very fond of recommendation 10 you know I, I think that's sort of about the importance of designing our curbside and streets for accessible use but also for um to make sure it promotes road safety um, and making sure we are building infrastructure for vulnerable road users like pedestrians and cyclists. So that they're, they're probably my two call outs. Um, but yes, I'm ha happy to move into Q&A and the panel. I might stop sharing as well. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley and Graham, for your presentations. Um, just a reminder to um, those tuning in, um, do drop any questions you have um, via the text Q&A function. Um, it's just below on your screen. Um, uh, and we'll pick up some of those questions um, as we go through the panel. Um, so uh, as as Ash, as I pointed out what her sort of favourite recommendations were, um, I just wanted to open up that question to the rest of the panel um, and um, hear your thoughts on what sort of were the key takeaways, the key messages that chimed with you. Um, let's start with Lindy. Um, thanks, Nicole. Um, look, we uh, have found this white paper really, um, I don't know, really refreshing and, and reassuring because it's certainly a journey that we started off in Campbelltown um, through actually putting into practice what a lot of um, Ashley and Graham have talked about. So we started a um, master planning process two years ago where we did incredible consultation with thousands of residents and businesses and stakeholders uh, to determine what they wanted for the future of the city, knowing that we were going to grow quickly. And it really validated, it, it, it really validated the need to revitalise particularly our, what I would refer to as our high street, which is a Queen Street, which is the spine that runs through our city, um, connecting the civic and cultural spaces of, of our CBD. So, the two things that Ashley and Graham have pointed to are, are things that uh, we have been working on, and that is that it has to be a, a genuine, true collaboration uh, with stakeholders, particularly with business and with government. And we were just so lucky because uh, at the same time that we had landed uh, our Reimagining Campbelltown Master Plan, we were so fortunate that Alex's uh, team had put out the uh, opportunity of streets as shared spaces. and. Uh, we were one of the, the lucky candidates to receive some money to do some testing and trialling on our, on our Queen Street, and we've called it on Pew. Um, so over the next 12 months, we're actually going to be trialling and testing some of the principles that have been highlighted in the white paper and actually work with businesses particularly um, to see how they respond to that and, and be able to talk through the principles that impact on them as businesses, but that also brings more business to them, if that makes sense. Great, thanks so much for your thoughts. Alex. Hi, Nicole, um, and hi, Lindy. Um, yeah, look, it's it's really exciting to, to hear this work today. I mean, I think it's great that the movement in place framework that the government released in March, um, that people are using um, and really what that's intended to do is drive a better conversation about how we can get both movement and place outcomes. Um, and there's a whole series of kind of tools and guides and, you know, um, um, sort of governance frameworks that are really there to try and prompt a different conversation about how you can get a better balance between movement and place and what does a co-design process look like. Um, and so we're thrilled that, you know, you're talking about things like an agreed vision that's developed in partnerships between business, local government, state government. And, you know, Lindy, I think um, Campbelltown demonstrating some really great um, leadership in how these things can be delivered on the ground. Um, and I suppose my other sort of reflection is, 
that COVID gave, COVID gave us all an opportunity both to kind of really value those public spaces and, and for us in government, a chance to kind of pilot new things. So the Streets of Shared Spaces program, that your, your high street program that's gone out um, more recently, which is the second round of that. I mean, that's really funding from government to try some of this stuff, to get people comfortable. I mean, I think sometimes um, Australians, um, you know, very kind of, some people still pretty wedded to their cars and parking and worried about what's going to happen if we try something different. Um, and I think COVID with the, you know, because there were less cars on the road and because people needed more space to move about, there was a willingness to try new things. And we're seeing some of those things being rolled out at the moment. I don't know if people have been down to Coogee Beach, but um, part of that road closed and people sitting outside in parklets. Um, you know, parts of George Street that we've, you know, part of my group, Placemaking New South Wales, has closed the sort of part of the road at the rocks um, and we're, you know, piloting, piloting outdoor dining. And, um, you know, so I think lots of examples of city of people trying new ways of, of sharing the street. Um, and that's happening across the world. You know, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with someone from New York who was talking about how they're doing something similar in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, so great to see those examples. So really what I wanted to say today was fantastic that you're talking about this. We're really keen to partner with the committee. You know, any data you have, your members have that, that you know, we can use to kind of um, take the conversation forward we think is, is fantastic. Wonderful. Um, so I'd like to touch on what might be some of the challenges to implementing um, some of these great principles um, that you've either already encountered or um, you've heard stakeholders talk about for your discussions on the paper um, and how might what might be some of the ways that we overcome them. Um, trials seem to be a, a quite a convincing mechanism to bring people on board or to demonstrate how to change things. Um, so um, Ashley or Graham, would you like to talk a bit about some of the challenges um, that were discussed when you were writing the paper? I'm happy to start and Graham, feel free to jump in. I think the thing we heard again and again is that without community sort of acceptance and buy-in um, that it's kind of, you can't do recommendations two to 10 without solving for one. And I think the reality is the community and businesses are very attached to their private car spaces and particularly businesses. Um, they think, and sometimes they might be right, but there is this perception that their um, customers come from those private spaces, uh, private parking spaces. And so I, I think, you know, we really, um, we need to take everyone on a journey of showing, you know, that that's not the case. And I think there are multiple tools that people can employ to do that. You know, what Lindy's been doing in Campbelltown, education and working with local businesses, I, I think is a great example uh, that, you know, she might want to touch on in, in a bit more detail. Um, so I, I think that that's really the big challenge is like getting that community understanding and acceptance. Um, I know, Graham, if you want to add. Um, no, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And, and I think that's, that's probably the, that's the, the hallmark in terms of how you achieve that. And it'd be great to hear from Lindy next about that example, because I think that's, that's so powerful. I think one of the other challenges that was really recognised was in terms of enabling these local places and that multimodal piece is, it's not necessarily treated as, um, as it's not the, the sexy piece of infrastructure, but, but what do those footpaths look like? How do we get level footpaths within a 50 metre catchment of our, of our local places or, or, or to the bus stop that gets you to your local place that you want to support that people get off the bus as a more efficient and effective way of accessing their, their local place. So, so how do we raise the profile of that sort of local infrastructure spending and prioritisation? Um, and, and I feel like now's, now's a great time to have that conversation when we're considering the rise of local places and, and prominence of local places day to day as, as more people work from home, that that opportunity to, to, to put in that infrastructure to, to enable access for, for people of all ages and abilities is, is a challenge, but one that we're probably well placed to overcome at the moment. Yeah. Does appraisal methods or the way that we currently 
try to quantify or monetize the benefit? For, is that an obstacle to implementing some of these things? I'll, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll answer any question. Yeah. <laughs> Unless anyone <laughs> jumps in. I think certainly, but I think it, it comes to a degree of prioritization as well and, and challenge on, on, on funding. Um, so certainly there's opportunities in how I think we've seen certainly a focus on smaller works packages and how it's been possible to, to package those up a lot more effectively and efficiently um, post-COVID as, as those inverted commas shovel ready projects. So there are opportunities there, I think, but in terms of getting up the priority list, I think that's been the key, being key challenge. Great, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that money's the problem. Like, I, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's about helping people to reimagine what their street could be like. And, you know, I think that's why we went out quite deliberately with something called Streets of Shared Spaces and talked quite public, like quite openly about how streets are one of our the most important forms of our public space. Um, and. Often I think you can shift behaviour with pilots because, or, or shift sort of community views with pilots because, you know, people try something and actually, like, they find that they quite like it. And so one of the things we've tried to do is um, develop kind of guidance tools and also a very community-led approach where we really ask the community, you know, what did you like, what didn't you like? Um, and we've tried to provide a range of resources to councils who are getting funding to try these new things. Um, so that we can start to collect a better data base about what, what works and what doesn't, and that can inform, you know, future pilots. And the reason why the second round of streets sh as shared spaces is, is focused on your high street is really trying to engage local business in, you know, what's in it for them? How can, how can you know, thinking about streets differently uh, work for local business and I think you know shifting link thinking um, from business as well about you know actually it might be great for their business if they could have outdoor dining or customers sitting um, um, you know in parklets or whatever it is again like that that's a, a great way to get business to, to try try new things and for us to collect data from community and and from business about you know what worked and what didn't so we can continue to evolve. Great. And you, from the local government point of view, Lindy, what, what arguments really convince, um, you know, the local high street to um, give up parking, for example, that always seems to be a hot topic? Look, I, I, think, I think that's what is so uh, fantastic about the opportunity that um, DPI have given us through this streets as shared spaces, because we're actually working in partnership uh, with private business to trial and test some of these things. And I'm not expecting it just to be all smooth sailing. There's going to be issues that will need to be worked out. I was talking um, you know, to Ashley and Graham yesterday and I gave an example prior to us getting this grant where we had a little park close by to the high street that we started doing some night markets. And we got quite a reaction from the private business saying, oh, you're taking away from us. And we had to work with them um, through consultation and education to say, well, actually, we're bringing people to your business. You know, they'll wander away from the little market pop up, come and see that you're there. And then when the market's not on, they actually know the places to go to. And that actually, we collected data and worked with them and proved to them that that was actually what happened. So now we've got, now we're, we're into the more controversial stuff because what we're actually doing through this um, trial is we are taking away diagonal parking and creating a much bigger curbside. Um, we're making it colourful, we're putting more trees, providing more shade. Uh, we have a little mall area that we are going to, it used to have a stage on it and now it's, I literally was walking down the street yesterday because we've just started some of the transformation and it's all grass now. Um, and it's just so, it's an exciting opportunity to sh demonstrate to business that um, there's actually huge flow on benefits to them. They, they think that they need the car to park in front of their front doorstep, but actually people congregate when they've got places to sit and things to do. So I really am quite excited about it because I actually think 
for, for us, consultation as local government is very much around education as well as listening. And for us on our high street, it's really fragmented private ownership. So it's very challenging. So eventually we want to be able to redesign and redevelop our high street to have bigger setbacks. But if, imagine if you could do the setbacks as well as take away the car necessity and the parking necessity, what an amazing curbside you could create. So I guess it's a, it's a means to an end. If we can at least establish and show business how making it more people oriented actually brings a good economic benefit to them as a business, then hopefully when we get to the redevelopment, when we get our, our towers of urbanisation, we'll also be able to convince them to set back their properties so that they even get more of that curbside to enjoy. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to shift the discussion to talking a bit about the competition between Link and Place. Um, the report talks a lot about the value of um, Place and obviously the movement and Place function um, has been established to sort of um, envision and then Im implement. Um, how do we deal with those conflicts, especially in places which have high Place and Link function um, and, and decide how to go forward? Um, would Ash or Graham like to talk a bit about the proposal in, in the report and then we'll move on? Let me, um, yeah, of course. So I think we, we've kind of talked around a little bit in terms of the, the vision piece, but certainly we have that, the, um, the supporting uh, infrastructure of strategies and policies that, that support that as well. So we need to get our, our road or street network plans right, of course, the relative functions. I think we could put our hand on our heart and say that those network plans have done a great job in terms of describing movement functions of, of, of the network and, and the different um, roads or streets within that network and not, not so great in terms of place. And I think that's, that's coming on, but it's how do we meaningfully reflect that? So we've got a really solid appreciation of the place roles. And then how can we reflect communities' ambitions and, and local government ambitions for, for their centres and reflect that in how we describe the, the road and, and street network? Because I think then, then we've got a clear articulation of our, of our goals in terms of movement and place that's, that's mutually informed by, by community. That, that we can work to. Um, and so once, once that happens, I think then you have the appreciation of what our, our movement goals are, our, our place goals are for, for those different streets and locations. And there's an opportunity to work towards that. Okay, um, would Alex or Lindy like to jump in on that question at all about the challenges between place and link function? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would just to sort of say that um, the movement in place framework, I think, gives us a pathway to start to 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 deal with some of those issues. Um, and, you know, we completely agree that sort of that shared vision about what we want this place to be like is really key. And that's a core principle of the movement in place framework. Um, and, you know, it was only released this year. So we're sort of starting to get people to use it, to work with it. And, you know, people like transport planners, people within, you know, planning teams, you know, it's, it's encouraging those professional people to think differently about the balance between movement and place um, and empowering them with tools to understand that differently. Um, and it also gives them a kind of a framework to, about, like, so there's sort of tools about, you know, the, the technical sort of understanding how movement works, how place works, but then also a sort of framework for co-design, which I think is really important. You know, what is that shared vision? And, you know, those sort of curbsides are gonna become more and more contested with all of the different kinds of modes that are available now. I mean, I think we're just gonna see more and more growth in that. And I think other cities are also grappling with the same issue. So you know, we really need to be proactive in planning for those things so that we don't end up with a kind of ad hoc kind of um, something that just sort of emerges. Um, we really want to be thinking strategically about how to share those curbsides and making sure that we plan for that in a way that is going to meet the community's expectations over the longer term. Um, so, you know, 
I think those those practitioners guides and the tools and the frameworks, I mean, they are really, you know, if we can get people, people to use those way to answer some. Lindy, any thoughts on um, you know, how do you deal with the competition? I think especially for historic high streets, um, they are both you know the where the movement happens and where the place function would ideally be. Um, how do we ma manage that on you know the most granular level? Look, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think if I talk if I talked about a greenfield development, for example you've got a blank canvas to, to do your planning for high quality. But as a local government authority, we've also got to balance that up with the developer to ensure that we're getting the main, you know, like the, the main practical infrastructure, but also ensure that you're getting a quality livable outcome. So that's, that's your, your greenfield development in an urbanized existing area. And this is something that we, we are facing, um, in Campbelltown because our growth is about to double in the next 10 years. But a large proportion of that is through urbanization of our city centers and our railway corridor. And I think that's where it is trickier and you have to be able to work very collaboratively in and in partnership. You've got to look at your LEP and your planning instruments. You've got to be able to have really open uh, conversations with uh, developers. But for us, uh, I think in hindsight, I, I just, you know, I think it was probably more good luck than good fortune, but we started this process a good two years ago by doing a visioning exercise with our community. And that was the best thing we ever did because we sought the vision from our community themselves. And the community told us that they wanted more livable spaces and better public domain and they wanted, they love the green environment uh, feel of Campbelltown and they wanted us to retain that even though we were going to get growth they wanted to retain it so I I can't uh, support Ashley Graham and Alex anymore in saying that the visioning is critical that whole visioning piece is so important because it helps that conversation come along then when it does come to the tricky bits where you say actually I'm going to take your parking away but remember, this is what you wanted and this is what the community wanted and this is why we're doing it. You know, people, you don't do things to people, you actually take them along the journey with, with you and demonstrate how wonderful it is. And that's what, like Alex said, part of what we're doing with um, our Streets as Shared Spaces is we're collecting data and evidence as we go. Everything we do now is, is evidence-based and it's really important, but I think that whole conversation around um, taking people along the journey with you is just critical to that success. Great. So a really interesting concept and, and policy recommendation from the report for me um, is the one around dynamic management of the curbside, um, but also pricing the curbside. I um, uh, wondered if um, Ashley Grayman had any thoughts or examples of where that's already done and um, been done um, or how that might look like in practice. Um, you know, in the in the shorter term rather than long term, when we have um, those visualizations you presented earlier, how do how do we bring that across the line to implement that, and then how might that actually look like? Graham. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll I'll jump in. I think I think we do have some examples here and there. I think. Um, there's areas in Sydney, for example, that you can have a look on your phone and see where where there might be parking spots. And that's an element of, of that dynamic management or understanding the curb. It's one step on the way. And then there's different um, proposals worldwide where you can see where they, they limit access based on type of vehicle or, or purpose of, of trip. And that's, that's an element of it too. I don't think we've really seen locations that have, have put all the, all the pieces together so far. I agree with you, it's, it's so exciting and, and an opportunity to really make the curb work harder towards the place function. And we've got a question that's been added to the, the chat as well around that role of technology in, in curbside management. And I think that that really nails it. There's the way that 
technology has moved on in terms of sensor technology and connectivity as well to people's devices or in-car devices means that we can have that rapid understanding of what, what is available or not or changing the use. Um, and so there's an understanding of how people want to access a place, I suppose, by, by different modes. But then there's also that consideration of our vision for the place and, and what we want to achieve. And we've got a, an opportunity there through that technology and how we dynamically manage the curb to, to limit access in different ways, whether that's, and so that requires regulation, of course, and that requires policy. So it's not, you can't say we'll dynamically manage the curb by, by itself. And there's an opportunity there for pricing as a signal as well. We use pricing already in terms of general parking. We have resident permits which can be priced, but they're pretty clunky and over long time periods. What, what does it look like if you want to price the curb within 15 minute increments? Um, and, and you can use that to, to limit different types of, of use as well. And when we look at um, new mobility and different forms of mobility, if there is a policy decision, for example, from government that we want shared, a shared automated vehicle fleet, for example, rather than privately owned, you, you can manage the curb through technology to say that shared vehicles will be the only ones that can drop off pick up, for example. So it's this scarce resource managed by government. How do, you, how do you want to use that to achieve your policy objectives? A lot of opportunity there. Right. Ashley, you jumped yeah, in. Yeah, I, I think you said everything actually, Craig, but I, I guess I would just say from an Uber point of view, like we, we would support pricing, but like keen to see that it's um, it's done by use. So we make sure that, you know, the pricing signals are there to encourage the most productive uses of the curb. Um, you know, with obviously mass transit being, the, you know, the number one in terms of productivity, followed by shared transport, you know, and in last place parked cars. And how so might some it's important of the to note sorry. as well. Oh, sorry, sorry, Nicole. I was just going to say, how might some of the uses of the curb vary throughout the day? Could you sort of paint a picture of who might be using it when and how the demand changes? Oh, 100%. So very much aligned to our vision for the place. And I think one of the um, challenges at the moment with, with curbside is about those static uses. There might have been decisions made or joining land uses 10, 20 years ago. And, and the way that the curbside is managed continues to endure to, to support a land use that might have disappeared 10 years ago. So this provides that opportunity to, if it's through dynamic management, to consider what, what, what is the, the type of access that people have during the day. So that Crown Street example, people popping in for a takeaway coffee or to drop off the dry cleaning during the day versus lingering, lingering and settling and dwelling at, at cafes and restaurants through the evening. And then that consideration of mode varies. So, and we need to think about the curb, not so much in terms of dynamic management of, of private vehicles coming in, but what does that look like for um, bikes, scooters and, and e-bikes too with, with freight tasks, whether it's uh, dropping off a, a meal or, or goods. Um, what does that look like? And of course, the extension is if we are more productively managing the curb, then perhaps we can reallocate some of that space towards other functions, um, such as such as trees or or shade. Yeah, great. Lindy, any thoughts on how dynamic management of the curb might might change? places we're trying to create? Would it, for example, um, would the pricing work out that it would be um, what would make sense for restaurants to buy a parking space to create a parklet or outdoor dining? Um, how does that all fit in with other, other initiatives we have going on at the moment? It sounds very complicated. <laughs> but look, I, I certainly think that um, these times require innovation and I do think that uh, we need to work with government to look at innovative solutions to achieve um, the vision of community. So I think we just need to explore every potential um, but I just yeah look I think it's, it is complicated and that whole um, 
commercial negotiations and looking at economic benefits. Like, like we take a really large route and I don't know whether it's because it'd be interesting what Alex thinks, but I don't know if it's because we're at a, a fringe metropolitan council, but we get really excited about anything that's going to boost our local economy. So we actually see it as an investment into our city when we do things like this. So we probably look at it through a slightly different lens than a, than a the CBD of city Sydney centre maybe. So, but I'd be interested in Alex's view on that. Yeah, Alex, over to you. Oh, look, I, I think it's the same, you know, I, I think it's the same in the CBD, you know, I think it can be a real lever to drive, um, you know, um, support for local businesses in the CBD. That's what we're seeing in the rocks as well. But I suppose it's sort of that balanced outcome of, you know, it's great for business because there's more people sitting outside and I think that attracts, more, you know, people often attract people. Um, but then there's that also that sort of community outcome, which is fantastic, that sort of, you know, sense that people are using spaces differently and that, you know, there's different ways to get around. And I suppose one of the, one of the positives about COVID has been a sort of opportunity to use these spaces differently. And what would be great is if we kind of continue to do that. So, um, you know, I'd be interested, I mean, I, I don't know with Uber, whether you, I'm assuming you've seen a massive increase in um, people using your services, um, um, particularly things like, you know, home delivery of food and stuff. I mean, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see, like, what's changed for you in the context of COVID and what out of that might you want to take forward um, in the context of um, mode share? But I also think there's just that broader issue about, you know, um, change over the longer term, like technological change and, you know, the change. I suppose part of the, the issue is, a lot of the way we use streets is kind of, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? It's kind of what people think of as normal in terms of what's happening in streets. And even now, the way we use our streets is different to the way, say, people use streets in Amsterdam or Paris or, um, or you know, um, um, you know, thinking about Asian streets. Like, so lots of different, a lot of that is because it's a public space and it's where community comes together. And so I suppose it's about how do we, think more broadly about opportunities around these shared public spaces and have, and that's why I think it's so important that there's these collaborative discussions where business, government, community are all talking about, you know, what do we want our streets to be like in the future and how could we use these shared spaces differently? Great. Ash, did you want to jumping on that? Yeah, um, just on the COVID piece, uh, we released um, a COVID movement index a few months ago um, that looked at um, some of the movement mm. patterns from the April lockdown through to June and like the slow recovery. And so mm. there's some interesting things in there if people want to have a look at that. And I'm like, I need to write the next edition and it's on my to-do list after this project. Um, but like one of the interesting things for me that we saw is when cities started to open, people did be begin moving again, but they were moving into suburbs. So they were visiting friends and families at their houses. They weren't going to high streets and restaurant precincts like they used to. And, you know, a large part of our business is what, you know, we call social hours. It's people going out on a Friday and Saturday night um, to, to entertainment districts. Yeah. And so, I mean, in, in terms of like, place yeah. outcomes is so important for a business like ours because we want people to go out and visit those places because, you know, that's, that's where a large mm -hmm. majority of our business comes from. Right. Yeah, and actually, I think data is sort of showing that um, that there's more happening in sort of Parramatta and um, parts of Sydney, like Lindy's, um, as opposed to the CBD. I think you know there's there's pockets of the CBD like the Rock where there's lots happening, um, but because there's been a downturn in um, you know, workers coming into the city, people aren't sort of going out after work. Um, and so one of the things the government's focused on is bringing people into the city. You know, how can we make the city an attractive place to spend your time on the weekend? Um, and really revitalising the city as a, as a place to go and enjoy yourself. Um, and, and that's, you know, um, you know, and I think that's happening across the, across the globe. Um, you know, I know when I was on this panel, a few weeks ago, same thing happening in Singapore, in New York, you know, that sort of people, the sort of downturn in commercial office space in the CBD, um, um, you know, means that we need to rethink, um, you know, and, and sort of encourage people to come in and use those spaces maybe in a different way. Great. 
Great. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so I um, thought it would be good if um, all the panelists could comment on um, essentially a question Ash brought up earlier, which is what do we need to do today and prepare for tomorrow? So what is the most important thing to do? Um, let's start off with uh, you, Ashley. I'm trying to think of um, what, what I haven't already said. Uh, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we really need to look at um, the sort of our reliance on the private car and um, you sort of private car mode share isn't really going anywhere. And so but I think something that COVID has taught us that maybe um, there is potential, you know, if industry and government do work together, um, you know, like, like in COVID when, you know, we all told people to stop moving, um, if there can, we can generate a step change um, in tra transport behaviour patterns. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we're thinking, thinking about a lot, you know, how do we actually, you know, reduce that reliance on private car use and, um, and how do we make sure the curb um, supports that? I think that's probably the big thing I'm sort of grappling with and thinking about. That's great. Over to you, Graham. Um, yeah, on a similar theme, I think my, my big thing would be for all of us on, on the call and encouraging others to challenge, challenge the status quo. I think picking up this project and being passionate about places, I think the role that the curbside plays is is crucial in enabling what we want from our places, but then also for people of, of all ages and abilities to access their local services too. But the way that we've managed the curb in a lot of contexts is, is probably more to do with history rather than what the current uses are around it and what we want from the place. So I incumbent on us where wherever we sit in the in the supply chain and and, and sector to challenge what's there in front of us and work out how we can make it better make curbside management allocation better to serve our places great um, alex um I, I think it's about collaboration so i think you know um business collaborating collaborating with government and state and local government i think it's about us together working through different ways of doing things. I mean, what we really need to drive things forward is great data um, and about what works and why, you know, sharing these spaces differently is a really good thing to do, what, how that benefits business, how that benefits community. And that's why these pilots are so important. And I suppose we also need spokespeople who aren't from government sort of really talking about why this is important and why we need to challenge the status quo and try new things. Um, but any data you've got you want to share with us that can help us start to shift that conversation, you know, we'd love to see it. We'd love to keep talking and we really congratulate you on, on having this kind of discussion. Great. And finally, Lindine, your thoughts? Look, I just think we need to be really brave and put people first in our planning. I really think that um, if we actually think about people when we're doing our technical and strategic planning, we can change a lot. Uh, with with the approach to curbside. So I think there's amazing opportunities out there and it, it does come back, I agree with Alex, it comes back to collaboration, visioning and just understanding that people want to love and be proud of where they live. Those are some lovely thoughts to end on. So thank you all for joining us today on this discussion of the curbside. We have a few more transport related um, panels and, and launches coming up this week. Um, tomorrow with Jos de Kock um, from Transport um, and also our Power Matter road, launch, uh, road paper launch, um, which is all about the high street and creating a better space there. So do check them out on the website and if you can, tune in tomorrow. Um, that just leaves me to thank the panelists for their thoughts and contributions today. Um, and thank you all. Thank you everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.